Today on the show, we're going to be talking about manipulation. We're reviewing Tender, and we're going to be taking your questions. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts, Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Hey everybody, welcome to Human Factors Cast. My name is Nick Rome. With me today I have Mr. Billy Hall. Hey everybody, how's it going today? Aw oh, man, what are we going to be talking about today, Nick? Well, Billy, we're going to be talking about manipulation. Oh no. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to have tricks pulled on me. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but before we begin, let me just give a huge shout out to Erica Ackerman. I love this woman. This woman is amazing. So what Erica has done for us is helped us out with the out artwork for our podcast. Uh, and I just want to give her, uh, give her a shout out because her work is great. If you like her work, um, you can find her on LinkedIn and we provided her email address in the description of this podcast. Uh, you, can, you can contact her. Um, so again, thank you, Erica, for everything. So Billy, again, uh, what are we talking about today? This week's topic comes from a suggestion of Scott, one of our listeners, in Pullman, Washington. Where is Pullman, Washington? Uh, it's, it's in Washington, so it's, it's in, uh, (laughs) it's in eastern Washington, kind of on the border of Idaho. Is it by a big lake where there's a giant alligator? No, you're thinking Florida. Oh, damn, you're right. I am. I was thinking movies. We, so just to note that we talk about what you want to hear about. Scott commented on our previous episode with the next pod sh- podcast should focus on how easily humans can be manipulated, which I am very easily manipulated by a game. I mean, emotionally, uh, telling me what to do and things like that. But um, what is it? Well, you know, I was thinking about this when I was talking about it, and uh, I realized you do a lot of manipulation just by your job. It, yeah, it's kind of my job description is to manipulate, but... Whether or not for good or evil, I mean, you can you can manipulate for good or for evil, right? And, and I wasn't even talking about your job, really. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> oh, you're right in both cases. No. <laughs> but what is manipulation in the form of what design or in, 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 in programming or what is it in in that sense in the, the, I think the just, human factor of it? I think just the basic definition of manipulation right it's it's some sort of social influence that um it kind of has this goal to change the behavior or the perception of another person um through some sort of uh, abusive deceptive or underhanded tactic right and so usually the outcome uh, with manipulation is to be in favor of the manipulator it really sounds like a whole little like 19, you know, 80 sci-fi movie, Big Brother is watching you sort of thing. I mean, it doesn't sound like a positive thing. How is this positive? Right, well, I mean... You what know, makes it happen? Okay, so... Well, to answer your first question, what makes it positive is uh-huh. it all depends on your intent behind it, right? So, if your intent is for the betterment of your user, yeah. I mean, okay... Let's let's be honest. Manipulation is all gray area. Okay. But you can argue that if you are in for the best interest of your user, whoever that may be, you can you can call it good manipulation, maybe. And I say that with a huge grain of salt. Like there's it could be it could be good, but really who can who can tell what your intentions are? So it's kind of like one of those exercise apps that they always make you use. It tells you, it talks to you, it makes you get out there and move around. Like the Fitbit tells you every like couple of hours to get up and move around, right? Is that a form of manipulation from your argument? Uh, it depends on what context it's used. So let me let me go into like what makes manipulation happen, right? So Okay. So um, there's a psychologist, his name is George K. Simon. And he basically states that there's there's sort of these three sort of pillars that need to happen uh, for manipulation, right? And Or for successful manipulation, I should say. So uh, basically the manipulator has to conceal aggressive intentions and behaviors. I guess so that's, that kind of gets back to what we were talking about, good manipulation versus bad manipulation. I guess it really can't be 
called manipulation if it's in the best interest for the user, right? So he, he says it has to be aggressive. Uh-huh. It has to be aggressive towards the user or, or the person. We're talking about just basic manipulation. We're not even talking about when it comes to, like, an app or a website or whatever yet, right? So that's one, is okay. concealing aggressive intentions and behaviors. They also need to know the vulnerabilities of the victim, right, to determine which tactics are likely to be the most effective. Uh, so it kind of goes back to last week when we were talking about you know, heuristics, right? Mm-hmm. If you know the person's lock combination, you're able to punch in 7, 3, 5, or whatever, because you know that's their favorite number, right? Right, and, right, right. And knowing that piece of information, you're able to manipulate them a little bit more. Uh, and I, I think it kind of... This all sounds like my mother. <laughs> I mean, this sounds like, I mean, just in general, it always seems like our parents, because nothing infuriates us more than family sometimes. Right, well, like. let, me, let me ask you this. With our parents, is it true manipulation? Because are their intentions aggressive? Because I don't know what kind of environment you grew up in. <laughs> uh, but for me, my parents always telling me not to do this or not to do that was always in my best interest. Right, 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 right. I mean, sometimes it could be within their best interest, you know. I, I can see that point, but for the most part, when I was doing something stupid and they told me not to, like, that's that's at least the kind of context that I just... Oh, okay, okay, so that's a form of... Like, how the parents interact with people is kind of a form of positive manipulation. If we can even call it that, I don't know if there's a word for positive manipulation other than influence. Influence? Maybe. Encouragement? Because yeah. manipulation, every time you hear about it, you know... It does you have a really... Sound like I've manipulated you like a puppet on a string. Right. Uh, so, so that's the second one, right? They're, they need to know their vulnerabilities of the person. They know, need to know where to stab at them. Yeah, they need to know their weak points. Uh-huh. And so that last pillar to make successful uh, manipulation happen, they need to have a sufficient level of ruthlessness. Uh, and, and this one just sounds... Malicious. This one just sounds malicious, man. Like, they need to have a sufficient level of ruthlessness to have no second thoughts about causing harm to the victim if necessary. It seems like that would be the most easiest thing. I mean, like, you... When if you're, you're a sitting, sociopath... Like, well, no, because, like, <laughs> the idea of it is is that, you know, it's kind of like... It's like that old experiment where the guy would push the button and it would electrocute the guy in the other room. You're talking about Stanley Milgram. Yeah, yeah, Stanley Milgram. That guy. Stanley Kubrick. Um, Milgram. <coughs> Milgram. He, you bring people in, you would push a button, the guy gets electrocuted, right? Okay. It's in another room. Uh, it's a button. It's a college study. So you're sitting at your computer desk writing code or developing a theory or collecting data. These are just faceless people in numbers. It seems like that would be a lot okay. easier to collect because it's not like it's your neighbor, it's your cousin, it's your wife or girlfriend or mother or father that's a really good point being detached from whoever it is that you're hurting definitely helps well helps quotes around that in case, like it helps in the sense that it facilitates this last point right so yes i get that um i mean this is all like those those facebook games or those mobile app type of ideas they know you know your friends are playing. You're playing. They're doing all this thing. They're visiting you. It seems like it would be a lot easier. This seems like the type of stuff they do and a lot of apps do to get you to play more or to pay more with paywalls and things like that, right? Right. So basically, um, when it comes down to it, though, all these pillars, right, when, it, when some sort of aggressive intention meets all these pillars, uh, the manipulation is likely to occur and it's likely to... It's likely to accomplish this by damaging some sort of social status or some sort of indirect uh, expression of hostility, right? So, like, passive aggressiveness. Uh, so, or, or through passive aggressiveness, I should say. Mm-hmm. Well, what kind of... Well, we've talked about, about it, but uh, what manipulation is, but how do you use that in design? Right, well, I'm not going to tell you the secret to, like, I don't know, hurting people, but I can tell you, like... Shit, tell me your secrets. <laughs> I will tell you what some companies use in order to either extort information from you 
or sort of get ahead in ways that may or may not be beneficial to you, right? And if it's not beneficial to you, that kind of falls under the category of manipulation. Uh-huh. So basically, there's there's a ton of different ways that companies uh, sort of get at this manipulation. Um, but but some of the more interesting ones, at least to me, are things like desire paths, uh, dark patterns, altering the choices that are available to somebody, even demonstrating somebody's achievement, or even the concept of closure. Okay, you know, I run a lot of D&D games, and you're sounding more and more like some sort of evil wizard or dark lord ready to manipulate the people in the world. You know, I mean, I'm assuming Dritz Dorden is going to knock on this door at any moment to slice you up, and I don't want to be here because I do kind of look like an orc. Well, I hope I'm not coming off like an evil wizard. I would like to be seen more like Gandalf, right? (laughs) We all want to be Gandalf! Fly, you fools! Fly, you fools! I got firecrackers and stuff. Can't know a real decent spell, but whatever. That's me. (laughs) So... You, the first one you mentioned was desired paths. Right. So what does that mean? What is the... Des- I mean, a desired path to me seems like the way you go down, the thing that you want them to do, kind of like go left instead of right type of thing. You want them to go left so that they don't want to go right. You reward them more for it. You're, re- you're really close. So okay. So what desired paths are... Have you ever been sort of strolling through a park and you're on a sidewalk mm-hmm. and you see a small, unpaved path off to either side of you that connects with the sidewalk uh, another sidewalk sort of down the road a little bit Mm -hmm. right and it's just kind of like a shortcut Mm -hmm. that that path is made by people actually treading through that right and it's people actually walking on this ground and preventing the grass from growing and there's been there's been uh, you, you can see this in like architecture for example so like when architects will design, like, let's say a college campus, they'll design it without, or, or at least this was, this was one case. I, I'm not quite sure of the reference, but in one case, they, they built an entire college campus without sidewalks. And they just put grass everywhere. And they waited a year to see where the desire paths Oh, that is so cool. Form. That is so cool. Right, so you can see, like, what pathways students were taking to get from one building to another. And that's where they built their, uh, their, their sidewalks. So, ah. so what this means uh, for apps, right, is basically to have the most lucrative or, or the most desirable action for the company mm-hmm. be the easiest to get to, right? If you have that you know, easy path. If you have a different pathway to where you have to go through 20 different steps to buy something on a website, for example, Mm -hmm. right, then then it's not going to be accomplished as easily as if they had what they call a call to action button. And that's just that big order now button on the website. I remember this kind of thing. Like, for example, uh, when I was playing around with, uh, just going back to the last episode, when I'm playing Pokemon Go, it's really easy to get to the store to buy things with actual money, which is what they want me to go to. They even say, hey, sometimes you need to do this. So it's just one button click, there you are. It's right there in front of you, easy to get to. you know. But the way, place to get free money is in the same place, but it's hidden in the top left corner. It's not readily available to see. Is that kind of the idea of a desired path? You got it. Yeah, oh. and yeah, I... The the easiest example you can see of this is when you go to a website and you see the big order now button. Right. Or buy it now button. Buy it now. One click order on Amazon. Click order. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, okay. Make, make the thing that's going to get the company the most money or the thing that's going to benefit them the most the easiest to do. Same thing with, like, the Steam Summer Sale. You click on a picture, it's right there in big letters, it's this much off, click here to do this. Right. Okay, okay. Okay, but... That wasn't the only thing you talked about was, you know, those seem like nice things, you know, desired path, you know, but then you started talking about a little bit something a little bit darker, a little scarier, the dark patterns. What are dark patterns? So this is when uh, the human factors wizards all come out, right? You are secretly wizards. I knew it. No. So 
a dark pattern, and these are really, uh, really fascinating to me, at least. Uh, wow, now I am sounding like a manipulator. No. <laughs> they're, fas- <clears throat> they're fascinating to me because it really capitalizes on the human species laziness. Uh-huh. Right? So what dark patterns are is basically some sort of user interface component that has been crafted to trick the users into doing something that's beneficial for the company, right? And so uh, one example of this can be seen like where the default option in in whatever selection they are making is not beneficial to the user, right? So kind of like the idea like uh, you might accidentally click into this situation without even realizing you've done it yet. Exactly. It's um, So w- one good example would be to... Uh, to think about those programs that you download and when you download it and install it, it says also change my browser to this. The default, like uh, Firefox does that. Right, right, right. Google Chrome does that. Right, so well, when you download an app, right, and it says, you know, also make Internet Explorer my default and make Yahoo Search oh, my... Oh, that, that is a call back. You're right. I don't own a computer, but you're right. I do remember those things. Right, so if you're clicking through, right, and... and, and you just are like, yes, I want to install this, right? And that's selected by default. You get back on your internet and your Yahoo search is your default, and it's really annoying. Uh-huh. There's, there's a company. Now, this company is pretty well known, and I'm not going to mention the company, but I think Aww. they actually got... You might know who I'm talking about just by listening. <laughs> there's, I think they actually got in a lawsuit... Uh, or They got sued for this very thing, right? So there was um, an issue where... It was a social media site, and basically what happens is you sign up for this thing, and you see all of your contacts uh, in a list that says, add your friends, right? And, and the app's permissions said, we need to access your contacts. So whether or not your contacts had a, an account with this company, they would still show up on this list, and you can just click on them and they would get a notification they would get an email saying hey so and so has invited you to be friends or whatever it is for that website I almost slipped uh, and and so then you know they're sending out emails um, that you have given them permission to do because it was a dark pattern it was hidden it was the default yes I want to share my contacts and it's it's so hidden that when you click on the person's name, you can't tell whether or not they're a member of that site. Right. I mean, I mean, those are a lot of things like that. I mean, like uh, uh, mobile games on certain social networks that actually do that thing as well, you know? Send this to all these people for yes. this thing. Exactly. And they might not even do it, and then they defriend you. And I'm really sorry about that, Chuck, Gordon, and Lindsay, which aren't real names, I know. But still. <laughs> Okay, but um, these are all choices people make. These are all options that you have. But you also, so you mentioned that people have choices. Right. Tell me more about the choices. So there's a couple different ways. One of the, one of the most sort of interesting ways you can use choices to manipulate people is sort of altering the choices that somebody has to make it seem like those are the only options, right? Or or maybe not highlight something that they didn't know was available, right? So, like, let's say uh, you can accomplish this by providing fewer options. So, let's say that when you go, you're you're using an app or a service that converts your real-world money into in-app currency or in-game currency, whatever it is, right? And so your $5 equals... 73 coins or tokens or whatever it is in this app, right? Now, let's say they give you three tiers of options. You can buy 20 coins for a buck. You can buy 100 coins for five bucks. You can buy 1,000 coins for 10 bucks. Now, what they're not... And let's say you can put in any denomination in between. Mm -hmm. This is most 
well known and well seen with gift cards, right? They give you these certain predetermined denominations. Twenty five, fifty, a hundred dollars. Yeah, and it's easier to see with gift cards. So I'm going to switch over to that example. So you have you have the different denominations of gift cards, but they you know they don't tell you that you can put in your own denomination. So you can, mm -hmm. but limiting those choices will either have somebody more likely than not uh, go and select either the higher or the lower option, and it'll probably tend towards the higher option, right? They'll, they'll be more likely to buy the $50 gift card because 20 is too low. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know they could put in 25 Wait, you can change the amount on gift cards? In most cases. Oh, you're going to have a crappy Christmas, man. <laughs> All right. Now... You know, and th well, this can also be used. Let me let me back up really quick too. This can also be used to use uh, or to highlight the company's preferred option, right? Like, uh, you can alter their choices in this way, right? So if you are buying a gift card and uh -huh. you say, uh, "Oh, you know, most people buy the fifty dollars gift card, uh -huh. even though you you know you want twenty five, so you, you're going to be more likely to pick that fifty. You know, and then there's other there's ways to make the options hard to understand as well like don't not sign up for this thing and there's just a ton of different ways that you can alter uh alter these choices for people well a lot of people seem to actually have things like um I mean, like, uh, uh, a lot of people, when you get these things, it gives you a bonus. It's usually a better deal. These things, like you were saying earlier, these achievements. So it seems like, but not everything offers it. I mean, like, how does the idea of how much an achievement get or not get, how does the... Uh, you mentioned these achievements. How does that work? Right, so, well, achievements, they can be sort of a form of status... Right, or they can fancy hats and a lot of games. Exactly, um, and they can they can be used to highlight you know different groups. Right, like let's say you are a AAA plus member versus a basic member. Right, and as mm -hmm. the plus member, you get these exclusive things. You get um, sort of the uh, you know roadside assistance and and whatnot versus the basic members who only get the, the coverage. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you know, uh, being part of this status makes you feel that sort of achievement. Like I've achieved this because I pay for it. Uh, and basically, companies have you pay to be part of a group that you feel good about yourself, right? Because you're socially better off than I have that nice new fedora. I have roadside assistance. Exactly. I now have the gold armor in Overwatch. Right. Not to say that people who wear fedoras are you know, all AAA plus members. But because, it helps. <laughs> I mean, we don't we don't want to partition our audience here, right? <laughs> right. So, well, you can there's there's another way too, right? So you can you can think about sort of even achievements in games, right? So like uh, It seems like it's the most relevant one that's around. Right one of now. them. I mean, there's there's been a lot of gamification with just regular apps, right? Like Audible has their yeah, achievements their achievements for right there. reading. Yeah. Right, so they're trying to gamify everything, but just, and that goes to show you the testament that, yeah, this works. I right? mean, it's a like, really addictive thing. I know a few people who are just diehard achievement hunters in games and things like that, and that's all they ever talk about. Right, and so. Ever. Oh, you're making a jab at me. Forever, Nick. I'm a trophy hunter. What you I always have to hunt all but the trophies. Let me let me explain what's going on here. So okay, when you okay. when you make sort of these arbitrary achievements um, or or trophies, I guess uh, you you quantify it, right? You make it tangible. You make these things. It all comes back to status, right? If you get these things, other people will see that and sort of you know, know that you have done these things in the game. And now that may or may not be true, and trophies and achievements don't hold up on a resume, but, <laughs> but you know, it makes, it makes you feel good inside because you've done something that not a whole lot of other people have done, right? And that's the, the, it makes you play games or use apps in ways that you normally wouldn't. Right. 
I mean, and it leads to a sense of completion of, of, of the last thing you were talking about, closure, right? Yeah, and this is, yeah, this is basically the desire for completedness, right? This can be seen in checklists when you're signing up for products um, or, you know, progress bars when you're going through a, uh, like a survey or something. And the way they manipulate you here is that, you know, when, when they get to that gotcha moment, right, where they say, all right, you filled out all this information that's taken you five, ten minutes to fill out. Now we need your credit card info. Mm -hmm. That's the gotcha moment, right? That's, I gotcha. But you're 90% done with this thing, so just give us your credit card and you'll be 100% done. Right, right. It's and, like those surveys online type of thing. Right. And I okay. mean, like, do this one thing and you'll be done. And, you know, it's often the biggest barrier that comes last, right? Well, you know, I mean, um, not to shamely promote, but... One of my favorite books, because uh, one of my favorite books I ever heard and read was uh, Chris Hardwick's The Nerdist Way. And one of the things he talks about is gamifying your life. You know, make progress bars for your tours, chores or goals you're trying to get to. And yeah. it gives it that. You're almost manipulating yourself, which is kind of like the positive manipulation you were talking to. You know, if you want to buy this new car, make a progress bar. Watch that. You put it in a way that money so you could visually see yourself getting closer to it, yeah, right? Yeah, and there's, there's a great book. I'm blanking on the name right now, but it's by Jane McGonigal, and she does, uh, she does a lot of gamification. She uh, made an app called Super Better that kind of gamifies exercising. Uh-huh. And it's, it's worth a read. It's really good if you're interested in you know, gamif gamification and understanding how things, uh, how, how that can improve your performance, I guess, right? And it all comes back to achievement, right? If you give them a taste of completedness in this process, right, they'll want to get, they'll want to get that platinum trophy. They'll want to get all of the um, points, right? They, they want to get all the achievements in a game, right? So right. they show you what's left. That way you want to complete them. Huh. I like that idea. By the way, we're not uh, paid or sponsored to actually promote Chris Hardwick's book. It's just one of my favorites. You should read it the nerdest way. I'll shamelessly promote on this platform. I don't care. Okay. Well, I have an audience of, like, what it, who, me, you, and whoever else wants to listen, but I will shamelessly promote whenever I can. That, that's just me, because I'm weird like that. But um, we talked a lot about this stuff, and this stuff seems really interesting. It seems like it can be used in a lot of different ways in your life, not just the... I mean, like, it is psychology, but, I mean, it can be used for a lot of positive and negative things. Like, I yeah. want, I was looking over all this stuff, and I wanted to implement some of these things in my role-playing games, you know, when I sit down at the table and play that, you know, give them that sense of a closure and achievements and, you know, altering choices and things like that. I want to give that to them. You're an that. awful DM because you want to manipulate your players. No, I'm an amazing GM. Ask Chris Perkins shamelessly promote people I like to. Uh, but I want to know more. And okay. we only have an hour here. What, we where do. else can we do? Where else can I go? Teach me, oh, Dark One. Oh, Dark One. So, you know, Chris Nodder, he has a really great book. And again, we are not sponsored by any of these guys. I'm just letting you know. If they want know. to. Yeah, I mean, we'll if you want to send us free copies, we can give it out to our listeners. But... We're not sponsored by anyone, but Chris, Hard or Chris Nodder, you had me thinking Chris Hardwick. Chris Nodder, great. we're supporting two Chris's in this podcast. I love it. Chris Nodder, you're amazing. He is amazing. He has a book, uh, and it's, it's titled Evil by Design. Uh -huh. And this, you know, the, the stuff that we talked about today kind of gives you a taste of what he goes over in that book. Uh -huh. But really, he breaks down how companies use manipulation or, or sort of these techniques Based on the seven deadly sins. And oh, that is so cool. Isn't it? I yeah. dig that. Yeah, so, and, you know, his goal is basically to get you um, to understand what's going on, right? Those companies, those evil corporations evil trying to do companies. their bidding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a great read, and it talks more about some of the things we covered today. But anyway, this is the part of the show where we do a review of something you guys, our listeners, send in. Now, this could be anything from a video game to a website to an app on your phone. We'll take a look at the usability of the app and compare it against 10 usability heuristics. What are we reviewing today, Billy? Hold on, i got to get into the right tone here. <clears throat> We're going to talk about some love in the form of the app called 
Tinder. Gonna start a little fire. Right? Oh yeah. What what is Tinder? Tinder is a location-based dating and social discovery service application. Social hang on. You said social discovery service. What yeah. does that mean? I, this, this is a is, family program. This is a family program. <laughs> so in family terms, <laughs> What does social discovery service when mean? When a boy and a girl like each other very much but don't have time to actually go re-meet real people, <laughs> they go to Tinder so that they can just kind of like, you know, slam together in kind of like a blender form. You know, men, women, seeking men or women, and either or goes in this sort of app. But it's quick and easy and it gives you that instant gratification, and if you're lucky, it'll give you some other kinds of gratification. So... How? PG, yeah, I did okay there. That yeah. was okay. That was okay. So how do you like Tinder, Billy? Do you use Tinder? I used it when I was younger for okay, the like, exact reasons intended, probably. Okay, so so you were looking to slam some bodies up against somebody else. I wanted to get in that social blender. You, now <laughs> I am in a happy and loving relationship with my fiancé, <laughs> who I love and care deeply about. And, and you wanted to get into that social discovery, right? Right, you know? Okay. I had to ask permission just to download the app again to do research on this thing. Yeah, today. I did too, <laughs> and I actually didn't even end up downloading the app. I actually did the review on your he phone. He chickened out. Out. I did, but you also had a download. You had a you had a account already made, and I just didn't want to associate that with my. My Facebook. account was deactivated. Now for the next six months, I'm going to keep getting Tinder notifications through my email saying, "Are you sure you want to close this out again?" Which I do. Once again, I love you, Kia. Don't hate me. Don't don't. I nobody. I met nobody on it. But um, I failed at Tinder. I failed. Horribly at Tinder when I was on it. I don't know. Once again, I think I because I looked like an orc, or because I just don't have a good duck. Face. Yeah, I was about to say, was that because of the app, or was that because of um, so was was that due to the usability of the app, or was that yeah, just due I, I to? I don't know oh. because there's some changes that were made when I went back on the app, and I want to talk about those. But I think we can talk about it as we go through these. Like um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was. The, the number one one, the visibility of the system statuses. Right. This is, as a user, I know what's going on. Right. So, in Tinder, right, uh, um, it gives you sort of the idea of a, sa of a status, of the status of the app, basically, mm -hmm. right, as soon as you start interacting with it, right? Right. Now, it doesn't necessarily give you any affordances. Um, it doesn't tell you how many likes you have. It doesn't tell you... That these things are limited, that kind of thing, right? It didn't seem to. Now, mind you, I didn't start a, st uh, uh, a profile at the beginning of everything, but it it didn't seem to tell you that I had a limited amount of likes or dislikes. Of, I mean, I can dislike people all day long, which is a very negative way of going about it. I think it really is. But I, where's the I, love? Yeah, where's the love? I mean, uh, where's I can the, only love like where's, thirty-two times. Where is the social discovery? <laughs> social discovery. I really love that we're sticking to that idea. But yeah, it was a little bad about it. I think, I think it doesn't really take you through it. It kind of just makes you stumble into it. But it's not very, like our last one with Pokemon Go. It's very, um, what's the word? Pokemon Go doesn't tell you that you have limited things, and it's not very good at it. But this one punishes you for it. It's like every like eleven hours if you run out of likes, that you have to wait. That's almost like a daily login bonus, right? Yeah. Come but, back to our app. It's a dark pattern. Ah. Uh, Would that be a dark pattern, though? Because it's, it's a carefully crafted interaction that... Well, everybody knows swipe left, swipe right. Who Do they? Are tech well, savvy. Now, now it's a convention. We'll get to that later. Oh, okay. But, uh, but, I mean, that would be kind of a dark pattern because you just get used to swiping right because... You're sad and lonely, and you just want to like everybody. Right. Well, let me talk about affordances really quick, because this is one thing that I think the app doesn't really do. And, you know, like I said, I didn't sign up for the app, so I didn't see, like, the opening sort of deal. But when you're just looking at the picture of somebody, it doesn't give you any indication that you can swipe left, swipe right, or swipe up. It just kind of sits there. And, you know, it doesn't do this until you actually interact with the picture, right? So when you interact with the picture and you swipe slightly to the left or the right or up, it kind of gives you this overlay, right, that tells you what that action will do. Oh, crap, I didn't even know you could go up. What does that do? Super like. Oh! 
cool. I didn't even know it did that. We all learn something new every day. <laughs> I've never used any of this thing again. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so so what do we got next, Billy? Okay, so the match between system and the real world. Right, so this is basically, as a user, I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Right? And, right. I mean, for the most part, they do, right? I mean, swiping feels pretty natural, right? Flipping pages to the left, uh, or, or sw- sorry, swiping to the left kind of emulates, like, flipping a book, right? Like, going to the next page. You're go- yeah, going, on. going on, going on, going on. Unless there's something unique or, or something that stands out. Um, un- unusual or desirable to you, then you're going to, you know, do the opposite action. You're going to swipe right or swipe up. Now, the up thing, and that's almost, I mean, like, Tinder seems like it really is following the whole book motto, you know? You're turning the page to go on, you know? Or you're going back because you really like something. I guess pushing up is like ripping out a section of the book that you want. Oh, to I really like this section. Oh, oh, man, this is reading materials. I'm going to frame this. <laughs> I buy it for the articles. Oh, right, right. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously. Uh, so, so, I mean, overall, it kind of it, it kind of matches pretty well. I mean, Tender's a pretty simplistic app, but... Yeah, it's like that, that, that button metaphor you use all the time. The best app would be just push the button app, but it's not a very fun app. Right. All right. Yeah. I so, mean, what about the user controls and freedom? You know? All right. How this does is, that work? This is kind of like the emergency exit for the user, right? So, oops, let me out of here. Right, um, right, right. I didn't really see a whole lot of that with Tinder. I, I kind of felt like, you know, when I accidentally liked or unliked, or, or uh, I accidentally unliked, or what is the what is the swipe left? Uh, hate? It's not hate. It's what not is, like, it's nope. Nope. Okay, when I accidentally noped somebody, or when I accidentally liked somebody, you know, it gave me no way to undo or, um, you know, uh, unless I paid. And... You know, as a user, that's not that's not something I want to do. I just right. want to I just want to get into a uh, what is it social social situation? What is social it? situation. Social discovery. Social discovery blender. Yes, I just wanted to get into a social discovery. I didn't want to have to pay for this. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, that's the other thing. Uh, I mean, when we're talking about it, uh, if I like, I'm sometimes. I mean, before this app, I guess this is kind of a plus to the idea of limited likes now. But when I used to do this app, I would always go like, uh, these people, I don't, uh, no, 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 no. I would go through 30 people just saying no. And then I would accidentally see someone that interests me, but I would still be in that pattern of going yep. no, so I wouldn't be able to go back and do like. Right, now, you get into a rhythm of things, right? They do have an undo button. God, dude. No, no, no on everybody. What, what kind I'm of standards picky. do you have? I'm yeah. picky. I am too. Uh, but they do have an undo button. They do. But if I pay. press it right now, oh, I have to pay. I have to pay for that, which is silly, I think. I mean, give me so many undos, but at least give me something. Yeah, I want a social discovery. Not man. that I would have bothered picking undo on any of those pictures because it's not like I was looking for anybody at the time. I love you, Kia. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, you know, we talked about manipulation. That's, that, <laughs> that's borderline extortion. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay. But, I mean, like, this app ha- seems to have a lot of consistency and standards, which is the next one. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, so this just seems familiar, makes sense to the user. Right. It's almost uh, in our society nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it works well. There is that undo button. That's that's pretty familiar to users, but again, you have to pay for it. Um, right. You know, it also has, like, the typical X that you would find on most apps. This is the nope option. You have a heart, which is, I like it. Um, and then you also have this star, which is seen in some apps like a, like a favorite option yeah. or a bookmark. Apple um, uses favorites a lot like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I, I feel like it does a pretty good job. Uh, and in terms of, so so it sticks with the standards. It doesn't really switch them up, so consistency isn't really an issue. But the one thing to me that w- that was kind of a uh, a novel idea when this came out was uh-huh. the swiping. Right, that really didn't go with any standard up until this point. But we'll talk about that later. What's next up? Okay, error error prevention. Uh, yeah, this uh, which is usually something you do after a Tinder date. <laughs> oh God! Oh God! Oh God! What did I do? Oh man! Billy's got the jokes over here. Dang! Error prevention. <laughs> it's social discovery. 
Social Discovery, so. right. The night after Social Discovery. So that's, uh, what, your thesis on the Discovery? <laughs> oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, what did I do? Anyway, is that so... A, is that an appropriate opening sentence? Oh, man, let's get back on track. So air prevention. Air yeah. prevention is basically, glad I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Which in that context, right? So, no, I mean, when it comes to Tinder, though, this, this really sucks, but not for the reasons that we just illustrated, but, you know, for the reasons that, unless you pay, right. you know, if you pay, all this is great. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about it, like, from, from the perspective of the everyday user, right? I mean, unless you pay, you can't undo, right? It doesn't ask you to perform, per, or to com, confirm the like, right? Do you, are you sure you want to like this person? Like... But are you that, sure you want to... I mean... Isn't that kind of the style of the app, though? It is. Go it fast is. and hard? Mm. Right. I mean, that... Wow. This is a family show, Billy. I, you took it there. I didn't take it there. You know what? We kind of opened it up when we talked about Tinder, but let's just... Let's bring it back in. All right. I mean, that is kind of the name of the game, though, right? Like, you swipe left, you swipe right. You have to make a decision before you commit. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. You know? I, I mean, it tells you the, probably the first time that you open up the app, but... Probably not after. I mean, mm-hmm. like, are you sure? Yes, this is. Are you sure? This is. This is what this means. But they don't go into it after. Yeah, I mean, it inv- it, it, it it rewards you for going quickly, getting to the next person, or not getting to the next person. You have to be kind of picky and choosy, right. which is kind of the idea of the app. What's up next? Recognition rather than recall. So this is uh, from the user's perspective. This is basically I know what I need to do here. It's right. kind of a no-brainer with this app, I, I think. Kind of is, yeah. I mean, so you you log in, you see the picture, and you see these options, right? Uh, X, heart, star. Pretty self-explanatory. Right. To what degree the star differentiates itself from the, the heart? Who knows, really? But, you know, it's all there, right? Mm-hmm. Star and heart probably mean something positive and X probably means something negative. Now, the one thing that I was talking about earlier was the swiping left and swiping right. Now, this this has become sort of a convention, right? This is something that you see now in other apps. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, the, um, the way this app, when, like I said, when it first came out, there weren't any real standards for this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, people now know what it is, and so when they get on, they know to swipe left or right. But right, it gave them. You know, there's no way for them to recognize that there was a way to navigate this app in another way, right? Right. So, I mean, they do recall the options based on what they see on the main screen, or, or uh, sorry, they recognize what they see on the main screen, but they they need to recall the like gesture based right 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 the gesture based of it I mean they can just use the buttons but it's just the gesture based and this goes into kind of the idea that I was thinking of the aesthetic and minimalist design now this thing app does it perfectly in my opinion because it's simple it's easy to understand and use the app I mean it might take a little work to re- like you know set up but it's bam bam I'm in you know I know what I'm doing yeah I mean it's very simple you know what to do. Mm-hmm. It's, I I would have to agree with you. It's very it's very simple. You, you kind of have a good idea of what's going on. Right. What's up next? Uh, the other one was help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. Now I don't see a lot of errors that ever come up from Tinder, other than oh god, oh god, I did this wrong thing. But it's kind of like a shrug your shoulders and move on with your life. Well, yeah, and I mean, it's also from the user's perspective, right? I know what went wrong, mm-hmm. and I know how to fix this. Right. Uh, and you definitely have that, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you have the, I know what went wrong. I accidentally <laughs> liked this person, or I accidentally didn't like this person. I noped them. Right, and you can always stop talking to them. I know tons of girls did that to me. I mean, well, yeah. <laughs> can you blame them, really? <laughs> Just kidding. Man. No, but, okay, when it comes down to it, that part's easy. But it's the ability to undo, right? It all comes back to the stupid paywall. Right, it, it really does, like, it's like a weight on the end of this app. This app would be probably so much more usable if it didn't have that stupid paywall attached to it. Right. That's the thing. I mean, okay, so the last one we had, uh, we talked a little bit before the show, but help and documentation. Right, so this is... From the user's perspective, I need help, right? right. Uh, 
you know, is there an easy way for me to get access to the help? And, you know, it's a little hidden. I mean, you have to go into settings. Right. And then you have to go down to, I think it's like just help or something. It's a... Uh, help and support. Help and support, which, I mean, you know, help and support is typically found in settings. It's just a little hidden. Um, maybe like a tip section just that A tells, little fact queue that they download? Well, not even that. Just like a... Um, like a little thing that that gives them some sort of feed uh, feed forward, right? You've heard of feedback, right? right. After you've completed an action, uh, you get the feedback that you've done it. Right. But feed forward is this concept where, you know, like let's say you're on the main screen, right? And and the uh, the picture of the person in, of interest kind of wiggles to the left or wiggles to the right, right? It tells you that these are the actions that you can do, right? It, right tells you kind of how to use the app. Um, now, that would that'd be nice. They do sort of supply this FAQ section outside of the app. You know, it would be nice to see it, see it inside the app. But, I mean, overall, they do a pretty good job. They kind of break it down by category. Now, you said it was a little bit off due to the fact that you had to go to a separate website. Like, it takes you to the Tinder website yeah. and you actually do that. Yeah, that's but what I was saying. But I was saying that it's an app that's constantly updating, that people are monitoring. Wouldn't it be easier to take it... Wouldn't most mobile apps go take you to a website first over everything else? They do, but I'm saying, like, if there's just some sort of in-app tip, that would be, like, the most common... A question question. Yeah, I mean, you know, something that's not going to change, something that's static over time. That's, that's all I'm saying with the in-app stuff. See, like I'm saying, though, I mean, just... My little closing thoughts on using this app before and now um, is that the really the biggest thing is that this paywall hit you like a brick. You know what I mean? Like, like a brick paywall? Yeah, yeah, you know, really, it's it really hinders this app. Like, I, I, I originally dis- uh, brought forward discussing this app, one, because it was very different. It was mostly different than what we were doing before. You know, and that's what we try to do. We try to keep a little variety from show to show. But the other side of it is, is that this thing, Pokemon Go overtook this thing. And I can see why it took the, over this thing. Because it has more social interaction than this. What do they call it? I keep forgetting. <laughs> social social discovery. No, social, social disco- discovery. Pokemon Go has more social discovery than this app. Does. If I go somewhere that Pokemon Go tells me to go to, chances are I'm going to run into other players. You know what? Pokemon Go is almost being used as a tender replacement for social discovery. It's it's out there. I mean, people. Oh are... my God! You telling me I could really use the line to a girl if I was still single? I choo choo choose you. Ah. Uh, hey, girl. Let me get a Pikachu. <laughs> this uh, is. We thank could... God we found women. Thank God we found women that to put up with us. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. The paywall is really what comes into it, you know. But I mean. You know what? Overall, I think it's. It, I would never use it, but no. I mean, well, maybe if I was like alone and really desperate, and like I, I don't want to bash anyone who does use it because you know if that's if that's your cup of tea, that's fine. It's just not for me. But in terms of usability, I think it's pretty usable, right? Like, it's at its core, it's pretty simple to understand what the concept is, what you're doing. It's easy to navigate. I mean, it's it's like your argument is it the app works. The app is heuristically successful. I would agree. Uh, but on a, on a personal note, I think it's flawed because of these things. The not, paywall. Not to mention, just one little quick thing I really wanted to bring up here because we believe love is love in this type of podcast. And the, and I put down women and men just to get an idea of both sides of the app, even though I'm a straight male and everything like that. I didn't really think anyone was going to take me up on it, but... It said, show me, I, it just says in the app setting, show me men, show me women. But it doesn't necessarily say, show me men that are my orientation. Or show me women that are my orientation. This could be manipulation on their part, right? They just show you anyone of that right. sex or gender to sort of get you to expend your likes and spend more on the app. That's the thing. A lot of people do that, but they don't actually talk about... Some of them say, yes, I'm gay in their bio, little bio blurbs that they have here and things like that. But not all of them are. Some have actually said that they are looking for women in this thing, in their bio, like some, some special girl. And they still showed it to me, even though apparently I'm also looking for men. 
And that yeah. right there is just flawed, you know? I mean, yeah, if they could find a way to get around that. But that would make the app a little bit more usable and open. Because other dating sites do it. Right? It's true. But uh, we want to know what you guys think. Do you think we're out of our minds? Do you think we're spot on? Let us know in the comments. Let us know what you want us to review next. We're always looking for new things, and we're always listening to you guys. We want to know what you want us to review. But this next part of the show, this is where we take questions from you guys, our listeners. If you want to be featured on the show, send in your questions. We're all over social media. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud. Send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Billy, what's our first question? All right, our first question, which I'm really excited about. I think it's actually our only question today because we're running short on time. That's fair. Our first question comes into, in the tech field today, you see a lot of companies using the term UI and UX interchangeably. Whoa, really quick. Who is this from? Oh, it's from Blake. Like we mentioned earlier, Blake. No, no, this is, this is a different guy. We have oh, it Scott. is? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This is so amazing. We have so many Blake. listeners. Blake. Blake writes, in the tech field today, you see a lot of companies using the term UI and UX interchangeable. What are your thoughts on UI, UX? Where do they overlap? And where are they different? Now, what is, what is UI, UX? What do you think they are? That's, I, I want to get your perspective, right? Because you're not in the field. I want to know what you think these things are. Well, I know that UX, I don't know what the term for UX is, but I do know that in my company, they use UX as kind of like a testing for like uh, people testing the software or the product and things like that and getting their feedback from it live. They have like a big room that they put people in and do interviews with who use the product that I help make. Okay. And uh, what, what do you think UI is? Uh, I would think it would be the online version of it, but I'm just stabbing in the dark here. Okay. So the first one, UX, uh, it, so let me, let me kind of back up and, and kind of give a broad overview of the controversy. So um, what's happening in a lot of tech fields is that they're kind of lumping all this stuff together into one thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's been sort of this outcry of people who have gone, no, wait, no, we're not all one thing. You know, we're not those unicorns that you're looking for. We are, you know, fairly specialized in what we do. There's the UI designers, mm -hmm. like Erica Ackerman, who put together our logo. Love you, Erica. She would do something like, you know, create the visual appearance of an app. Mm -hmm. She would go through, and on Tinder, she would make, like, the X. She would make the heart. She would make the visual appearance of all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm grossly oversimplifying their job, and I'm going to grossly oversimplify all jobs. But what a UX designer typically, or, or what, what we kind of consider ourselves to do, is to kind of design the overall experience, right? How does a user go from step one, log in, to step five, get a social discovery? Mm -hmm. Right? How do they go through that process? And what is their experience of using the app? It's called user experience. UI is user interface. Now, there's almost like a third branch here that uh, Blake didn't mention, which is this uh, this research, right? And it sounds like at your company, there's um, they do the UX role, almost does this user research role, right. where they will bring people in, assess the usability of a product, mm -hmm and sort of see how it's doing, you know, with real users. And, you know, what it comes down to is that there's a lot of overlap with these three different roles, and there's no clear definition where one starts and the other stops, or and the other begins, you know? Like, so oftentimes you'll find the UI designers are working closely with the UX designers uh, to sort of, you know, the UI will be based on the experience, and so they're collaborating together, and the researchers validating these sort of things that they found, or, or sorry, these things that they've kind of cooked up, and it all it all kind of blends together. I mean, what I think is that, you know, we each have our own role, but at the end of the day, you kind of got to have that overlap to work as a team, right? right. And and. I think, One hand helps the other type of thing. Yeah, I think the problem, though, is that these companies, they have human resources who just kind of go... Uh, they, they look online and they see UI UX designer, and, it, and all of these specialties are kind of lumped into one job title. Mm -hmm. And it's like... Uh, there's even... Okay, 
I'm going to back up one more time. There's even more to this, too, because there are the developers as well. There are the developers who need to actually implement this, right? So the UI designer is not coding up the uh, buttons. They are just developing the look. The UX designer is not you know, saying that this button should behave this way. They're just saying mm -hmm. it should behave this way. They're not coding it up. So there's the uh, software coder behind everything as well. And what you'll often find in these job descriptions is you'll see people or companies who lump all the responsibilities together. So you're going to have a job posting that says, I need you to be familiar with uh, the Adobe software suite, which is what maybe a UI designer would be right. comfortable with. I need you to be familiar with research methods, which is maybe what a researcher would be familiar with. I need you to have experience with Java or, or coding in C++, uh -huh. which is what a developer would have experience with. And, you know, to really focus your skills in on one of these things, it's really just, you know, unreasonable to ask people to do this. And so I think what Blake is trying to get at here is, uh, you know, that, that it's not the people in the sort of field that need to be aware of this. It's, it's the companies, it's the higher-ups that are creating these job positions, and they need to understand that they each bring something unique to the table. Whew. Well, that seems very complicated. There was a lot there. I mean, that's almost like a show in itself. Maybe we will do a show about that later. Yeah, let us know what you think. Do you want to hear more about UI, UX, and research? But for today, that's it. I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn.com slash Nick Rome. Billy Hall, where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter under Comstar Kirk. Until next time, it depends. depends.